When you, Kayla, raise your spirit higher by Lady Smith Black Mombazo. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. Our guest today is Adam Habib, South African political scientist at the University of Johannesburg. What's special is that we're interviewing him not in Johannesburg, but here in the United States. He's just come into the United States after years of being barred by the Bush administration. He's come here with a delegation. In fact, Adam Habib, you went to school here, didn't you? Yes, I went. I went to school at the Graduate School of the City University of New York. It's now on Fifth Avenue, but I remember when I was here, it was still on 42nd Street, opposite Bryan Park. Mm -hmm. um, how did you learn that the visa, the bar ban on your visa, had been lifted? Well, we knew that there were debates, there were conversations happening between the lawyers on the State Department side and, and the ACLU uh, for a couple of months now. Uh, they, the last court decision, which was about June, July, had said. It gave both sides about six months to provide deputations on, on, on the one hand from, from, from the State Department side to declare why they had excluded me, and from the ACLU side why they thought video conferencing wasn't good enough. And uh, that, that was supposed due in, in September, and, and the ACLU had been asked for a couple of months, a couple of weeks extension, and that drew on for another couple of weeks and a couple of weeks, and that took us to about December, January. And the ACLU had some inclination that they were trying to figure out uh, something in the State Department to find a resolution to this. And then in January, I was informed by the ACLU, Melissa Goodman in particular, who said to me, look, uh, uh, Secretary Clinton has just signed an agreement, a waiver effectively, that says that the rationale that previously excluded me can no longer be applied by the United States government. And, and they hadn't indicated what the rationale was. So officially, I still don't know why I was excluded. Uh, but clearly, they said that it can no longer be applied, and they asked me to go in ahead to the to the local embassy and apply. I went to the local embassy with my family, my children, who had also been had their visas revoked, and all four of us were given ten-year visas in March, March, middle of March. So, what have you been speaking about while you've been here? Well, firstly, I've been here as part of a university delegation to meet universities uh, uh, to explore partnerships between my university and American institutions. We have already par existing partnerships with a number of universities, and this trip was meant to consolidate that and to build new partnerships and extend those. So that's what I'm here for. But in the process, I have spoken uh, uh, at various points. I've spoken uh, at Harvard University, at the law school, uh, on, a, on, a, on an ACLU platform on the issue of ideological exclusions. Uh, speaking to my issues and what I think are important about these issues and what are the big challenges. Uh, tomorrow I'll speak at the graduate school on, on South Africa and what's going on in South Africa. So I have had those kinds of things. I've done interviews like this and others. I wanted to ask you about um, Winnie Mandela, Wendy Madikizela Mandela's comments in the Evening Standard with the well-known journalist um, uh, Nadira Naipaul, who is also the uh, wife of E.S. Naipaul. Uh, in this interview, um, Winnie uh, Madikizela Mandela criticized the terms of the agreement that ended apartheid in South Africa, saying it had preserved the economic subjugation of the country's black majority. And speaking of her husband, her former husband, um, Nelson and Mandela. She said he agreed to a bad deal for the blacks. Economically, we are still on the outside. What do you think of this? Well, look, firstly, it's, it's worthwhile bearing in mind that she denied saying any of this. Yes. Uh, so that's something that's worth bearing, bearing in mind. But having, uh, let's take those, those statements at their face value. On the one hand, I don't think South Africa had much opportunity. I mean, I think that the deal that was signed has certain positive features and has certain negatives. The positive is that actually the big alternative was a racial war. Uh, the ANC was in no position to defeat the apartheid regime. The military was intact. There was no capacity to move beyond uh, a negotiated deal. So the negotiated deal was the only game in town, if you like. And any negotiated deal was going to come with conditions. So, so I think Mandela bought us an opportunity. He gave us a space, the political space, to move to a democratic transition. Did that come without any costs? No. I think that uh, the political conditions, the structure, the power configurations in South Africa in the mid-1990s led to a very conservative macroeconomic agenda being implemented by the Mbeki regime, by Mandela, but also by Thabo Mbeki subsequently. In a lot of ways, we implemented a kind of economic policy agenda that was uh, implemented in, in the United States, uh, in, in, in Britain, in other parts of the world, except that they didn't have the social 
uh, divisions that we had in 1994. And so, in the first five years, we doubled unemployment in our society. Uh, economic inequalities in the last 40, 15, 16 years has actually increased. You're not saying poverty has increased, but inequality has increased. Inequality has increased. There are cases in the first five years where I think poverty itself increased. But with the growth, that uh, growth in the economy from 2003, I think that has been contained. Since 2001, we've had massive social support grants. Some 13 million people receive social support grants. And I think that's brought things down a little. But economic inequalities, income inequalities in particular, have increased dramatically in our society. So we went from the second most unequal society after Brazil to currently the most unequal society in the world. And I think that that's something that we should be ashamed of. The largest sporting event in the world is going to be taking place in South Africa in a matter of weeks, in June, uh, the World uh, Cup. Now, campaigners are saying that conditions in—is it pronounced Bikiesdorp? Uh, tin can town yes. are worse than in the townships created during apartheid. And in Durban and Cape Town, thousands of the city's poor who live in sprawling informal settlements say they're being evicted by the ANC's some clearance, uh, slum clearance policies. What about this? Look, there's no question that they are seed. Whether, whether you can make the comparison with, uh, with, the, with the apartheid period is difficult to say. In part because the problems have ballooned post, post the apartheid period. If you were in a rural area in the apartheid period, you were not allowed to come in, into the urban areas. After democracy, you were allowed to come in. And what people have done is they've basically grown around the, the urban cities. And you have got this mushrooming of shanty towns around the urban cities. Conditions are horrendous there. Uh, they probably, uh, you know, you probably, if you look, think about the uh, favelas in, in, in Brazil, uh, these are the kind of the equivalent uh, shanty towns in, in South Africa. Conditions are absolutely atrocious. Uh, is there a problem around service delivery? Absolutely. Uh, we have not delivered. Uh, as I said to you, economic inequalities have, exi uh, have increased. The rich in South Africa live very well. People like myself, middle and upper middle class people, can live very, very well. We can live lifestyles that are comparable with parts of the United States, uh, with, let's say, the citizens' lifestyles of Spain or Western Europe. On the other hand, the poor and marginalized in South African society live the lifestyles of citizens of, of uh, Benin. And that's the real t tragedy of the South African context. What do you think would have been an alternative form of development? Well, I think that we could have done more. For instance, I think in part we were constrained by power configurations in both the global and the national order in 1994. But what could we have done? We could have had a more social democratic agenda. We could have had the kinds of economic policies that were pursued in the United States in the 60s and the 70s, or the kinds of economic policies that were pursued in Western Europe in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and even elements of it today. Uh, because what that allowed is it allowed for a more inclusive transition. It integrated the society. It created uh, a social security net for the most marginalized. We didn't do those kinds of things. We went for growth. We went for, in part, inspired by models in the United States and elsewhere. And one of the consequences of that is we increased economic inequalities and we increased the polarized character of our society. And in that polarized character of our society, you have all of the kinds of problems that we have, violent crime, child and woman abuse, uh, extreme inequalities, polarized conversations, all of the kinds of things. As I say, if you want to understand the problems of South Africa, look to the United States and multiply it by 20 times. That's the nature of what South Africa is. In a lot of ways, it reminds me of a mini, mini United States with much more acute problems. I want to thank you very much for being with us, uh, Adam Habib, uh, Professor of Political Science, Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University of Johannesburg, barred from the U.S. for over three years now, for the first time returning. Uh, his, uh, uh, the ban on his visa with, with, was withdrawn by the Obama administration. Welcome again to the United States. We'll link to the details of your CUNY talk, the City University of New York Grad Center talk, on our website, democracynow.org. As we move now to Iraq, at least